apologize that I arrived so late. Uh, this is a bit of a stop of in between for me. Um, we started with a new bachelor program at my faculty, um, which is where I'm the program director of. It's the first time that we run it. It's called Data Science and Society. It's an interdisciplinary program. So we're in week seven now. And as you can imagine, there are many things which uh, we still need to figure out. And um, tomorrow I'm flying to Indonesia um, to uh, um, finish a cybersecurity capacity to, um, building uh, program that we, that we were running over the last two years. And uh, therefore, uh, I'm very happy that I'm here, but again, my apologies for being late and for missing so many interesting presentations. Um, what I want to do with this presentation is actually to stimulate more of a discussion and share some of the dilemmas uh, that I'm running into in my research and my work. Um, my specialization is in European human rights law. A PhD was in the right to be forgotten over the last several years. I've done a lot of research on privacy, surveillance, autonomy, security. Um, actually started at the University of Groningen in the, in the European law department, but in the meanwhile, I'm, and you will see that in my presentation, I'm uh, working in an interdisciplinary environment where we're thinking more conceptually also about policies and how they relate to governance and innovation. But still, the, the conference title was uh, Practical Legal Things. So I want to start with some observation on transatlantic data flows um, and then other uh, topics and then the end get a little bit more conceptual and hopefully stimulate the discussion. So um, very recently, I think it's also interesting to share you know, when it comes to transatlantic data flows, we're actually covering a problem or an issue that is there for around 20 years, how the system is working in general. So the um, data protection law plays a very big role here. Uh, essentially, the European Union framework is built in a way where we have, um, we used to have the 95 data protection directive and since 2016, we have the GDPR, the general data protection regulation. And the idea is that as Europe, we have as Europe as in the European Union, we have a very strong and high data protection standard. And if you want to send data abroad, then um, there are several ways of doing this, but the most convenient and probably politically important um, is to have an adequacy decision. Adequacy decision means the commission looks at the state of protection in a third country, particularly important for us as the United States, because we send back a lot of data back and forth over the, over the Atlantic. Um, and um, what then happens is that the commission looks at the situation in the third country, for instance, the United States, and then there is sort of a framework agreement which allows for sending back and forth data. Um, I already mentioned like this first uh, adequacy decision and framework agreement was called Safe Harbor. It's from 2000 after the Snowden revelations, um, which are already almost 10 years ago, started in 2013. And I'm mentioning that because when I teach bachelor students nowadays, I need to explain what the Snowden revelations are. So it's quite some time ago. Um, and uh, so after the Snowden revelations, um, a person called Mark Schrems, an Austrian lawyer who is now a civil society activist, challenged this, uh, which then led to striking down by the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union in 2016 of the Safe Harbor Agreement to got the replacement. The privacy shield was struck down in 2020. And now we have a replacement again. And what's interesting in the context of security is that um, this uh, general agreement where we now see the first, you know, this executive order of the you know, United States President Biden um, taking shape. So that this, this general agreement uh, was uh, also a consequence sort of of the Ukraine conflict and the West trying again to show, um, you know, unity because there are lots of fundamental questions uh, with this data being sent back and forth uh, and, the, um, uh, and the type of safeguards that exist, particularly in the US American system, uh, which are there to actually um, mitigate the surveillance and data sharing concerns with the intelligence community. And uh, we can, uh, what we see now, what is new with this type of agreement um, is that uh, it has two, it, it sort of beefs up a mechanism which was already there before. So the idea was, or the problem was, that uh, um, a data subject, as it is called in technical terms in the European Union, could not go directly to the United States and uh, ask, particularly in a security and intelligence context, um, whether its rights were infringed. Um, in the first uh, judgment um, on, on the Safe Harbor Agreement, the court stayed, um, um, you know, relatively strongly focused on the adequacy decision and on sort of the legal technical background, which was 
also criticized in the second judgment in the privacy shield where the court went also quite much into detail into the architecture of the American system itself. And it was quite surprising. So some academics have also highlighted that the court there commented on the architecture of the American uh, security or uh, uh, intelligence type of system in a way where it would not have the um, uh, um, where, where it would not have the capacity simple to the, the architecture of the functioning of the treaty of the European Union to do that for its own member states, right? So that was something there. But what we already had there in the original in the privacy shield was this ombudsman person where sort of in a soft law manner, European data subjects could then go to the yes and then we would have some sort of investigation. And what is now a difference in this new type of agreement is this data, data protection review court where you can actually go after um, um, the civil liberty protections officer, which is the replacement of the ombudsman person, um, has, has come to a decision. And then uh, what, I, what I find very striking from a dogmatic point of view is that in the, in the when you, if you look, for instance, in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU, you know, we have a right to data protection, we have a right to privacy. So we have two different rights in Article 7 and 8. But in the American system, when you look at the, um, when you look at how the legal framework is being set up, we have a right to privacy and the discussion, the public discussion and the discourse is about data privacy. And now all of a sudden we have this institution in the American system, which talks about data protection. So that is, this is very interesting that there seems to be some sort of convergence, but at the same time, of course, we have very different legal traditions. All this is happening on a, from our perspective, probably administrative level, you know, with executive orders, et cetera, whereas in the EU, we have the, the, this uh, um, uh, codified approach to this. So this is something which is going on at the moment where I think very concretely we have this notion of security and where you also can see that really the, the place of the EU and what it does is sort of trying to uh, become of a, a block uh, which has this uh, which has the standards and engages in that way with the rest of the world. And that is something which, um, which I would like to discuss and, and to a certain extent of the question because I'm wondering um, where we're going with this and, and what the direction with this is. Um, one of the problems with adequacy decisions as a tool at the moment is also that we're seeing that increasingly uh, the EU is using them. So we have now 15 countries uh, where we have adequacy decisions. Um, and uh, what is coming more and more back from the international scholarly environment is that um, it's not 100% transparent how the procedure works and how it runs. Uh, so once, uh, for, for instance, recently there have been uh, adequacy decisions with regards to um, uh, South Korea and Japan, and it was also in the larger context of trade negotiations. And that then raises the question, uh, you know, to which extent is there an incentive of the EU to use privacy and use data protection as a leverage, which might potentially also influence what is going on in those trade negotiations. And that is a very fine line between legal requirements and, and what is legally codified in the system and what is politically happening and what is happening in that regard. And that also raises to a certain extent pressure for the European Union because again, in detail, we do not know how adequacy decisions are being made and it's something that the commission does, right? So there's also a question that I asked at the conference at the uh, CPDP, many of you may know in Brussels, I asked that the person who is in charge of the adequacy decisions and I did not get a clear answer in public to that question. But this is something where I think we have to be careful with our system and consistency and, you know, what are we doing with this? At the same time, we see a lot of countries outside of the EU increasingly also doing the same adequacy, uh, using adequacy decisions. So for instance, with this um, executive order, what was also implemented from the point of the United States was a review of, you know, how high are the security standards of European states when it comes to sharing intelligence. So this is also something where you increasingly see this as a back and forth mechanism and where there is a bit of a question, um, which I'll come to later in this presentation. But let me move on to a second case, which is also very close to the work uh, that I do and which is sort of trying to contrast um, the other sort of case study that I already established, data autonomy in the cloud. And here I can stay very close uh, to home. So this is, um, so, you know, I am an academic. I work at the university, which is publicly funded. Um, all of our, um, or most of our data infrastructure is using uh, Google Cloud services. Um, which where we are an exception in the Netherlands, actually, because most of our colleagues use Microsoft Azure and Microsoft services, both of them being big American cloud providers. 
And um, um, I've, you know, because of my background and, and my interests, I've, I've tried to challenge the way institutionally, internally, how we use these types of services. I'm a part of a working group at our uh, university about data autonomy, uh, which we do with the Center for Information Technology, because increasingly the institutions, and this is a Dutch article, which is, uh, I think, just from yesterday, um, or, um, yeah, where, um, uh, you know, where the idea or where re increasingly institutions are realizing that uh, the data from three or four students is actually with, uh, with these cloud providers and that there is an, an immense uh, intensity and that's also the same for an independence and that's also the same for uh, schools. And then you see on the slides also I have a, a logo from another institution, Gaia X. Does anybody of you know what Gaia X is? Well, GaiaX is, an, uh, is a, the, a European initiative to develop a, a cloud uh, infrastructure, um, very much based on uh, on standards, um, you know, uh, accepting privacy, um, which has now been going on for years and making very, very little progress in that field, right? And and it's like this is a consortium which works together, and where the idea was also the Gaia X should be the place where the European health data goes and the European security data goes. So when we're building new jets, for instance, and they are all like you know dependent on each other because they are connected to drones and whatever, then all of this would go to Gaia X. But um, one of the big problems that this institution has, for instance, when somebody like Microsoft or Amazon or Google comes up to them and asks, okay, we want to join. Uh, Gaia X, but based on, you know, uh, we, we subscribe to your standards and then you get this really this, this discussion within this consortium. Yes, but they're Americans. Should we share the data with them? Um, you know, what, and then you really see the, the heart of the discussion here. So is it about a power based play? Is it about, you know, becoming a political identity and being for yourself in terms of sovereignty? Or is it sort of a value based community? Right. And this is this is sort of the um, and and it's not only a privacy issue or a security issue for us as university. For instance, it's also a, a, an issue of academic freedom. Um, there have been uh, cases in the pandemic where certain academic conferences on Zoom were stopped or could not go through because uh, Zoom took an issue with what was being discussed there. It also depends on how those countries relate to, um, on how those companies relate to countries where they operate in. You know, different countries have different standards when it comes to freedom of expression or what you can say and what you cannot say. Or in the European Union, we have differences about that. And then you're always going through this intermediary where there is an extreme dependency because you own nothing of the infrastructure that you actually need on your daily basis. And there is really also a discussion of autonomy in that space, which is emerging, but where, uh, for instance, the academic community in the Netherlands is starting to realize that uh, we're highly dependent and the initiatives that would be there to go in a different direction are really uh, not there to go anywhere. Um, and uh, so this, this raises a bit of a dilemma that I've covered in my research more recently, is, for instance, on this publication, where the question is, so when we, when we are looking at these international data flows, and this is part of a special issue on governing European data flows and how they, how they connect to international data flows, right? Um, so is it, is it about promoting European values or is it, a, uh, is it, about, is it about European power? And um, if you're sticking with the GDPR, for example, uh, you know, this is often being brought forward as, as, as sort of like the manifestation of where we are um, very successful, also with regards to this, uh, this concept and this idea of the Brussels effect, which maybe most of you, I assume now know, I don't want to go into detail um, if it in, in, with regards to the interest of the time. But um, what is very interesting there is that when we see and, and the harmonization and how that works globally when it comes to data protection, laws, we actually see that the GDPR is a strong example, but at the same time, uh, this is happening on a, on a national level, right? So we don't have an international sort of dialogue. We do have, there is this professor in, uh, at the University of New South Wales, Graham Greenleaf, who has a database on how many uh, data protection laws are in the world. There are 157 in 2022. Most of them follow the European approach, which is, you know, principle-based, technology neutral. It's called omnibus approach. And um, and what I, what I want to highlight here is uh, this is the European approach because this is an approach that comes from the 1970s. So that everybody thinks GDPR is something you know 
extremely new, but when you look at things like purpose limitation, data minimization, et cetera, it's from the 1970s, as well as the right to data access or transparency or all these types of things. There are some new things in GDPR, but essentially what we have here is over decades, uh, solidification of law based on principles, which then are sort of culminating in this, in this legal framework, which is the GDPR, where you then have a lot of um, a power which then goes upon, uh, with, with its appeal beyond and then other countries start to to uh, do that but then you know it comes to uh, comes to question why are other countries adopting similar uh, data protection rules for instance uh, is it because um, they approach substantively in terms of the values that it approaches is appealing or is it because the European Union is such a powerful player and I know I'm making here a very strong dichotomy and the practice is not that easy right but I think it's very interesting to ask about the question because again as you could see with the adequacy decisions it also reflects back on us right are we holding up those standards and are we holding up those values because we believe in them and we want to drive them or is it a sort of like a power-based play and I think we need to be clear uh, on this. Um, and it's particularly a problem because at the moment, as you all know, technologies such as artificial intelligence, they have a huge strategic importance, right? So globally, we're in an environment where the development of technology and having a stake in this is a strategic priority. And, and when it comes to, for instance, the regulation of AI, we don't have, you know, 50 years of where we can think about how to build nice principles which gradually evolve and solidify in international treaties like those of the Council of Europe, etc. So we are doing these things right now. And then there is a question again, so what are the types of values that we want to promote or is it sort of like a power based uh, action that we that we are following? And it's the same with the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act and all of these types of things. Um, and what I'm really wondering, and this is really a question that I want to share with you more widely, and I hope uh, even it's just for for um, for discussion, um, because you know when I was studying European integration, I was always like told there is like European integration in the wider sense, and we have the Council of Europe, and that we do the international harmonization, and that's sort of like where we slowly start to build the values, and then we have the more deeper type of framework, which is the European Union. But what I increasingly see in my research is that this is happening really in parallel. And, I, and I'm wondering, you know, what are we thinking about this? Is this good that we should be, is, is, is it, have times changed so that we really have to think about the European Union as a bloc which is strategically out there for itself and needs to defend its powers and, and hold up its force at the same time when it comes at least to this digital space, highly dependent on, uh, on private infrastructure which it, which, it con which it does not control. Um, or, and, and at the same time, we see also those new forums emerge. So for instance, I was uh, really struck by this European political community. And if you overlay the members of the European political community with the Council of Europe, for instance, you're asking yourself, so what is the Council of Europe space anyways in this discussion anymore? And what has happened to international, um, uh, international uh, collaboration in that sense. And I'm really, I mean, these are just like questions that I see emerging from my, re uh, from my research where, where I think uh, it would be nice to have a, um, uh, uh, a, a good discussion about and also to be aware of. So, uh, in, because at the same time, I think internally, when you just look at the European Union, its strength comes, of course, that from, from the consistency with all of these things, right? That we have these very solid models, which starts from a fundamental rights basis, where we have uh, democracy and the rule of law, and where we have all of these things. And we also know that there is a lot of um, uh, um, diversity within the European Union itself. So uh, being interested in European integration also in the more narrow sense, I think, means being firmly subscribed to this value-based uh, uh, proposition, because otherwise I think it will be very difficult to keep such a diverse club together. And, and we might be here at the, at the, at the shifting point, right? All right, so I know this um, uh, sparks a lot of uh, thoughts and discussions, but again, I would like to, to thank you to listening to my thoughts and giving me the space to talk today. Thank you very much. Huh? Um, without further ado, I will now give the floor to Max uh, with his presentation on energy security. Thank you very much. There should also be a PowerPoint presentation. Yes, perfect. Also, thank you very much uh, from my side for having me here. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Also, thank you very much for the quick uh, introduction. Um, 
Max Baumgart, I also introduced, already introduced myself uh, in the morning. Um, I'm talking about EU energy security and its external dimension. And uh, first of all, um, many of us have an idea what is energy security, but uh, just a quick reminder that energy security can mean a lot of things. It can, for example, also mean uh, the security of the energy infrastructure. We saw that also recently in the past weeks, also in the media, that uh, the pipelines Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 were attacked. So also infrastructure is a huge uh, issue when it comes to energy security. But, and this is uh, my main focus in the next uh, about 10 minutes, uh, is uh, energy security in the terms of uh, security of supply. And uh, we were also touching on this already uh, in the morning, especially uh, when I was asking uh, the ambassador of Cyprus uh, a little bit more about it. So, in the past years, energy policy was strongly driven by the aim to protect uh, the climate, uh, to achieve climate goals. Uh, and since Russia's war against Ukraine, this focus has shifted and we can observe a renewed focus on both climate change and the security of energy supply. I'm putting on this slide here because uh, in light of Russia's aggr aggression uh, uh, and the challenges that uh, are uh, posed by it, the EU um, uh, came up with the Repower EU plan uh, on uh, the 18th of May uh, of this year. And this plan uh, um, contains strategies uh, as a response uh, to, the hard, uh, uh, to the hardships and the global market disruptions uh, caused by Russia's uh, invasion. Uh, this plan aims at ending the EU's dependence on Russian fossil fuels, while at the same time uh, tackling the climate crisis. And within uh, the Repower EU plan, the EU Commission uh, also reshapes its external energy strategy with a uh, communication that is called EU External Energy Engagement in a Changing World. And uh, given, uh, given the short uh, amount of time uh, for my contribution and also in the light of uh, CLEAR's uh, uh, work, uh, I will uh, quickly focus uh, on this um, strategy and uh, uh, give you a short overview uh, uh, on it. So this strategy, uh, EU external energy engagement in a changing world uh, has three presumptions. Uh, first of all, Europe is still uh, too dependent on Russia yeah, as a, a supplier who is willing to use energy as a weapon. Uh, second, uh, while trade in conventional energy commodities will gradually decline, new commodities such as hydrogen and ammonia will begin to be traded internationally. And third of all, uh, e the EU still aims and keeps on doing so for the future, uh, aims at uh, creating uh, new partnerships through a rules-based approach. So the rule of law uh, will uh, be uh, um, uh, leading the EU's uh, uh, engagement also for the future. And there's one underlying aim, and that is to build together a new energy system that is more sustainable, more equal, and more collaborative. The strategy has uh, four chapters, an EU external energy policy for repower EU, supporting partners impacted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, leading and accelerating the global green and just energy transition. And last but not least, what I find very ambitious, of course, is laying the foundations of a new global energy system. Um, let's have a quick look uh, in more detail on these uh, four uh, big uh, chapters, big aims of the strategy. Uh, first of all, when it comes to the, the EU external energy policy for Repower EU for um, giving a response to the aggression uh, of Russia against Ukraine, uh, this EU uh, external energy policy consists um, of uh, several aspects. It wants to strengthen uh, the energy security in the terms of energy supply, the resilience, and it uh, explicitly mentions in the text the word open strategic autonomy. So it wants to support um, um, uh, an open strategic um, um, autonomy, and it also wants to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the EU also in the external dimension uh, um, thinks about energy savings and efficiency. So the strategy wants to move away from Russian fossil fuels, uh, and this requires uh, replacing these fossil fuels uh, uh, with fossil fuels from other international suppliers, considering that the EU, uh, the EU's domestic oil and gas production is much diminished, 
We import uh, uh, still about 90% of our gas consumption, 97% of our oil, and 70% of our coal needs. The, yeah, EU is mainly taking a coordination role uh, and aims at the diversification of fuel supplies. Uh, and this also um, 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 re uh, refers also to the fuel supplies for nuclear power plants, because some member states in the European Union also need uh, from Russia uh, fuel supplies for nuclear power plants. So nuclear energy is also is not the, the one great solution. There are also dependencies to, uh, with Russia. What is what are the ideas uh, within this um, uh, strategy? The EU must increase the gas imports from non-Russian sources. The EU wants to create an EU energy platform. We already had this uh, when we were thinking about the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccine. So a joint energy platform that will help to pool demand, coordinate infrastructure use, use and negotiate with international partners. Uh, the EU wants to help setting up a lot of LNG and hydrogen deliveries, uh, um, especially creating some working groups there. The EU also uh, thought uh, thinks of tackling methane leaks uh, uh, to address venting and flaring, because through venting and flaring, uh, a lot of natural gas is lost also in foreign countries. And um, if this is lost, it cannot be supplied to the EU. So that is also an idea for external uh, engagement there. Mm, the EU wants to prepare for uh, uh, renewable hydrogen trade as a commodity that will both help with security of supply and as sustainable uh, hydrogen also help uh, addressing the climate goals. Um, I have already mentioned that we also need in the EU sufficient oil supplies that also coal is an issue, so also there has to be a diversification when it comes to coal, and last but not least, to the fuel supplies for nuclear power plants. And if we look at this, at least three of these uh, main uh, goals that I um, identified here, uh, these um, uh, uh, address hydrogen, sustainable hydrogen, that is one of my main uh, uh, research focuses at the moment in Tilburg, so I was thinking, Yes, also this strategy uh, uh, highlights the importance uh, uh, for, for the import for, uh, of hydrogen. It, it says even that we will uh, need to, uh, to, to to produce and or import about 20 million tons of sustainable hydrogen. And uh, as we cannot do that only in the European Union, a lot of that has to come through uh, imports. The second goal is supporting partners impacted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That means especially um, um, to support the repair and reconstruction of energy infrastructure in, U uh, in Ukraine, to increase cross-border capacity to enable electricity trading. Um, we were also uh, having some thoughts uh, from the ambassador from Cyprus uh, on this uh, in, in this morning, at least uh, concerning uh, the East Mediterranean partnerships. Um, the strategy also uh, lays out the, um, that it, there is a need to facilitate the reverse flow of gas uh, to Ukraine uh, through the Trans-Balkan pipeline and also to set up this EU voluntary gas purchasing scheme, uh, but also to invite Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia and the Western Balkan countries to participate in this. So this is also a way to support uh, the partners impacted by Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. The third pillar, um, uh, and now I do think it, it gets even more amb ambitious uh, uh, um, on the second half of, of the strategy. Uh, the EU wants to yeah, lead and accelerate the global green and just energy transition to ensure, there's an underlying goal, to ensure sustainable, secure and affordable energy for the EU and the world. So again, there's also uh, um, um, the ambition to not only uh, care about the EU, but also beyond. And this uh, should be done through a focus on the biggest coal consuming countries. So focus on um, uh, the most polluting and uh, responsible uh, um, 
uh, countries outside of the Europe that, that, that are responsible for, for more than 40% of the world's greenhouse gas emi emissions, uh, promoting renewable technologies, also research-wise, energy efficiency, uh, also contribute with the European solar strategy to more renewable energy. Uh, uh, research I was already men um, uh, mentioning, not only to promote uh, the new technologies, but also to help to develop them. Then to avoid new dependencies. And there are already some discussions because maybe uh, uh, I just read in the German newspaper, uh, there are not some, some new agreements also with China. So also make not, to make sure not to create uh, uh, new uh, dependencies that will lead to a new crisis uh, uh, with China. That was the critic in the, in the, in the newspaper uh, this morning that I read. Um, so make sure that everything is diversified and that also these global value change, chains that are created, that they stay sustainable in itself, yeah? so that there is no need to diversify uh, them again uh, very, very soon. From a public uh, uh, international uh, perspective, law, law perspective, the EU also uh, describes in the strategy uh, that the EU trade policy plays a key role in this regard, and also that uh, uh, FTAs, free trade agreements, will play a very, very uh, crucial role in achieving this very ambitious goal of leading and accelerating the global green and just energy transition. Uh, last, but according to the EU, not least, uh, the EU becomes or gets even more ambitious and really wants to lay the foundation of a new global energy system. Um, it's hard to, to really identify what this means, but it means that this new energy system is sustainable, that this new energy system, uh, this new global energy system uh, uh, is, will lead to climate neutrality. And the EU um, kind of summarizes that uh, the, the Commission sum summarized it uh, in this communication um, very clearly to build long lasting international partnerships and promote the EU clean energy industries ag across the globe. So, this is really a challenge uh, we all, as lawyers, will, will have to engage uh, in the future. I think there's a lot of uh, work to do. Uh, one quick reminder uh, also in the strategy, uh, in the com uh, communication, uh, uh, the Commission already said the EU uh, Energy Charters Treaty must need uh, 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 to be moder modernized. Uh, to this, and uh, as many of you have followed uh, uh, this um, development, uh, yes, there is, I mean, already an agreement in principle for the modernization, and it should be formally adopted by the Energy Charter Conference in almost a month from now. But uh, when you see the news also uh, from the past weeks, already many member states withdrawing from the Energy Charter Treaty. And when you also go on the website of the Energy Charter Conference, uh, you will see that the Energy Charter Conference is lobbying now uh, to, to the member states saying, stay in the Energy Charter uh, uh, Treaty, um, uh, please uh, uh, stay in uh, there and, and uh, ratify the new a modernized uh, a treaty, then you will be able to uh, uh, give uh, not protection to fossil fuels uh, uh, for such a long time. When you draw out now, you still have to uh, give protection for more than 20 years. Uh, so it's better to stay in and ratify than it's ab around about 10 years uh, and not these uh, more than 20 years uh, that, that will apply when you draw out now. Quick conclusion, and I hope that I stay in my minutes, uh, and then we still have some, some minutes for discussion. Uh, a very broad uh, conclusion also from, uh, from my side, the EU tries to really rebalance the relationship between energy security and climate protection. And this is, I think, something also that we saw in all these many topics uh, from the today's conference. Uh, there are some major changes especially also due to uh, Russia's war against Ukraine. And therefore, the EU will need to um, rebalance many, many values uh, uh, for the future. And this especially applies uh, for uh, its energy policy. I think this, the, the past 10 minutes also uh, showed uh, to you that EU energy security is not only a matter of internal EU affairs, because especially when you also uh, um, want to um, um, uh, uh, yeah, get rid of these dependencies uh, and, and as the EU cannot um, produce all the needed energy in the EU uh, uh, itself at the moment, there is the need to import uh, uh, energy. Um, and in the short term, there's 
yeah, there is even no possibility to be independent from energy imports. And for the future, I think many international organizations, as well as uh, legal scholars, of course, uh, may be involved to build this new global energy system that the EU is um, aiming for. And last but not least, uh, that is my research focus, uh, there is the EU highlights uh, import and production of sustainable hydrogen uh, and its importance. And this is something that, uh, yeah, we will see probably also in the next years and we will need new ideas, new regulation uh, um, to really achieve both security of supply and uh, climate neutrality in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, as you said in your conclusion, what I find particularly striking